uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so today we have a very special session on statistics. I know that uh, most of you must be wondering why this session, but I think the attendance uh, shows that yes, you are interested in it, students. Um, so it's important because uh, in your theory paper, invariably there will be a short note on something related to statistics. And more important than that, uh, when you read the literature, uh, to interpret, to analyze, and to get a clear message from most of the publications, you have to know a little bit of uh, statistics. And today, uh, we have a very special faculty, a rare combination of a surgeon who knows statistics. Um, and I know very little, or I can say almost nothing about statistics. And that is why I have requested Dr. Piyush Thani, who is the Chief of GI Surgery at Ames, and who is also the editor of the National Medical Journal of India, uh, who has been the president of the Indian Association of uh, International Association of Medical Journal Editors. So I think uh, Dr. Piyush is busy uh, somewhere, but I'm sure he will join uh, in between. So uh, without uh, wasting more time, I'll uh, request Dr. Sudeep uh, uh, to start his presentation and uh, thank him uh, for accepting my request to deliver this uh, presentation in uh, JST. Thank you, Sudeep. Uh, thank you, sir, for this very kind invitation. Uh, this The topic was statistics for surgeons, but I must say that surgeons, gynecologists, physicians, and all doctors, in fact, have you know very poor background in statistics and training in statistics. I must confess that though I am speaking to you, I am speaking to you as a colleague surgeon. I am not a master of statistics, so that is my disclaimer. And I have statistical knowledge as working knowledge. And at the end, I will acknowledge all the people who have lectured to me. And I'm trying to share some practical tips so that when a student is writing a thesis, he should present the statistics well. And he hopefully should be able to converse with a statistician in a sensible way. Only a professional statistician will be able to really guide you. And the, uh, the aim of the talk is to put forward concepts rather than to give some sort of mastery. And time is short, so I will just like to start with a little bit of philosophy here. So we know that the universe is vast and there is something absolute called the truth. Now, we have no idea of the absolute truth or reality. And we know that there are many surgical truths which have been disproved. And the way we practice is changing every four, five, ten years. Because knowledge, as we imagine it, keeps changing. So we base our thought on what is truth. On observation, we generate a hypothesis and come to a conclusion. Or we have a hypothesis, we have a study or an experiment. And we conclude that what we, what we get is close to the truth or not. Now, the truth is never obvious to us for the simple reason that the human condition is very complex. There are many variables and confounding factors. There's genetics versus environment. You can give the same chemotherapy drug or do the same operation on two people and get two completely different outcomes. And nobody is the same. And actually, time might actually improve a lot of things. There are many, many factors responsible for this. So since we do not know what is the truth, we can only guess at what is likely to be correct. We always talk in terms of probability. So we talk of the risk of exposure to smoking on lung cancer. We know that everyone who smokes doesn't get lung cancer. So what is the risk of getting lung cancer if you smoke X amount of cigarettes? We talk about probability that a lump seen on a scan shows that it is tumor. And we talk about chances of survival and recurrence after treatment because it's not everyone who survives or everyone who actually dies in this. So all our discussions, even in our practice to our patients, are in probabilistic terms because the truth and absolute reality is something that only time and overall uh, you know, the experience will really tell us. So what is basically statistics? So statistics involves the collection of data. We collect data from a sample of a population. Now, as you know, the only test which is done on a complete population is the census. Other than that, it is impossible to study everyone to get a conclusion because of obviously time and resources. So we take a sample and 
often we try and take a random sample from the population to try and distribute all the biases which can come because of the random distribution of the human nature and we study this variables from this sample which becomes our data when we write a paper we like to summarize the data so that becomes the summary statistic and then we like to analyze the data to try and see whether our findings are by chance or whether they are reflecting the universal truth as i've explained to you now this talk as i've as i mentioned tries to understand the jargon and the basic principles i would recommend for the resources the more talks you listen the more you think about what people say the more you will learn the net is very helpful but only if you know the questions that you are asking if you just randomly go on the net there is enough nonsense there as you are well aware and please take help from a statistician because there are many subtleties in the design of these tests which might escape clinicians and they will really help you with this so i'll just move on to descriptive statistics so what are really the types of data that you can collect so you have something called as categorical data now these might be nominal where you are naming something for example male or female or chinese french indian russian which are ethnicities so you don't imply an order or a superiority of one or the other it is a simple description of what they are and we commonly collect this as the demographic data in our studies the next type of categorical data is something called as ordinal data where you have a descriptive term such as mild moderate severe stage 1 2 3 4 grade 1 2 3 4 and there is an order in this now this number 1 2 3 4 does not imply numericity so for example grade 2 is not twice as worse as grade 1 and grade 3 is not thrice as bad as grade 1 but it implies that clearly there is progression from grade 1 to grade 4 so there is a name to it and also an order so they would be called ordinal data then you have numerical data where the number actually has meaning that number 4 is twice as much as number 2 and this can be discrete data now the simplest way to say what is discrete data is data that can be counted rather than measured so how many patients are surviving at the end of your study how many children does a patient have so you cannot have 4.3 survivors you cannot have 2.25 children so this would be discrete data which can be counted and you have continuous data so something can be measured depending on the sensitivity of how you are measuring it you can have a measurement between two measures so your height can be 1.674 cm your blood sugar level can be 221 mg per deciliter so this would be continuous data and the blood sugar of 200 implies twice the blood sugar of 100 a height of 100 cm implies twice the height of 50 cm so the number has a meaning and just does not mean an order of progression so how do you summarize this data so depending on the type of data it is very obvious we need to summarize so if you collected all the data and your thesis and you just wrote it at this and someone looked at the paper or looked at the thesis they will say what on earth does this mean even if you put it in order it's a little difficult to interpret this so you want to make a summary of this and reduce it so if i tell you that there are 20 here and 20 there you can express this as a ratio by reducing it to 1 is to 1 so you can say that the ratio of males to females in your study is 1 is to 1 you can also express it as a proportion so you can say that 20 out of 40 were male and that will be a proportion of 50% obviously if you have 3 and 7 and 6 in your study putting it as a percentage would be meaningless it is better to leave it as 3 out of 7 or 5 out of 12 only when you have large numbers would a percentage make meaning and if you were to visually represent it a pie chart would be a lovely way because your circle represents 100% and then you could divide and then put in an absolute number because the aim of summarizing data is to give an honest picture to the audience of what you're really dealing with uh this is another way of representing this sort of categorical data 
so here you have a stage progression please note that these bars are not touching each other because there is no immediate progression from stage 1 to stage 2 so you will not crowd them together you will always leave a gap between each bar to show that each one of these is a discrete step rather than an absolute continuum and here i have expressed male and female stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 for the data to give you a visual impression now when you look at this bar graph it is not immediately obvious what the data is showing you might want to present the data in the best possible manner so this is exactly the same data i've just moved it around and here it is clear that you have more of stage 4 in males and less of higher stage in women so when you visually present data in your thesis try and present it in a format where the picture says a thousand words and looking at the picture please understand that this and this is the same data but looking at it should give a message and you're not just putting in a picture and using that space to actually for the sake of it you're putting it to put in a message another word to put in categorical data numerical data or discrete data is as proportions so you can make 2 by 2 or n by n tables depending on whatever data you have and then put it as a summary and this is useful for statistical tests as i will explain later to you so you can ex express this as a proportion as well the other thing when you come to numerical data is to understand that for continuous data you have measures of central tendency to express this data what are your measures of central tendency so you have the average which is the mean the median which is if you take 100 here the 50th will be at what time and you have mode which would be the maximum representation so if you plot the data where would it peak at what is the maximum number that you are representing if you have a symmetrical distribution so you would have the mode the mean and the median around the central point so your 50th percentile also reflects the mean and the maximum number while your asymmetrical distribution would be something which is skewed here and this will tell you that the mean the median and the mode do not match and therefore you will have to choose what appropriately represents the summary to the audience and i have just put in some examples here to show you data where you had the mean and median both as 100 right so you will find that the mean of this all this data is 100 but as you see this three data represent three com completely different sets so here you have a wide distribution so you have someone who is earning a lot someone who is earning nothing and very little here almost everyone is earning the same so just having a mean or median does not necessarily tell you everything about your data set so just this value is not adequate to summarize this data so you would also want someone to tell you what is the dispersion of this data around the central mean or median so the measures of dispersion can be the range so what is minimum and what is maximum but that does that just tells you two values the next would be the interquartile range so your median is the 50th percent you can also see the 25th percent and the 75th percent so that will give you four points on the curve and you can see something called a standard deviation which is a measure of how far each point is from the central mean and all of you are familiar with standard deviation it's something that you learned in school so that this will tell you how far each point is from the mean and will give you an idea of the spread of the data to represent this in a graphical form a box and whiskers plot is actually an excellent thing so here you would have the central tendency here you would have the interquartile range here you would uh, uh, sorry uh, here you would have the measure of the deviations here you would have the interquartile range and you would have the outliers present at this point so for example you had this very tightly compressed data you can see the central tendency 
interquartile range and the actual range is very easily fitting here here you will have the central tendency you have uh, you will have the range and you can see that everything fits well within that here you have this one single outlier which is more than four times the central tendency so that would be represented as a spot here and this would be how the box and whiskers plot would look so just visually looking at these three will tell you that this data which has the same mean and medium are actually very different and you could have the box and whiskers plot which software will generate easily for you so this is a good visual representation in your thesis or in your paper to tell you uh, to tell the audience in an honest manner how complex data is actually distributed within your population and statistical tests can be applied to this so a histogram is something which is very useful for continuous data here as you see the bars are joined together for the simple reason that this is continuous data for example height now when you join these bars together you can then plot a curve from the central point of each one of these bars as you narrow the width you find that the curve becomes more and more prominent and here you can see whether the data is uniformly distributed because what you will get is a symmetrical distribution like this and we are fond of calling this the gaussian curve and this curve of normal distribution which means that this is the variations which we tend to see in nature has some interesting mathematical properties so for example if you if you take a huge sample of the population which is randomly selected and look at height you will have that the majority are around the center you will find that within one standard deviation of this you will get 68.2% within 1.96 standard deviations you will get 95% of data and within two standard deviations you will get something like 94.5 uh, 95.4% of the data included within this if you take three standard deviations you will only have 0.1% outliers on each side and this is a magnificent property of nature which we can study using the gaussian curve and some statistical tests are based on this now another very interesting phenomenon which you must be familiar with in statistics is something called the central tendencies theorem we know that we are taking random samples from the universal population the means of each of these samples will vary because when you randomly select people you are not going to get exactly the same data each time right so sometimes you might take 100 people and get a mean height of 5 foot 6 inches sometimes you take 100 people and get a mean height of 5.8 inches now how do we represent all these means so if you took an infinite number of such samples and you took all these means and plotted these means these two would form a gaussian curve now this gaussian curve of all these means is distributed the same way so the word here is not a deviation because it is not an individual population but it is a sample of means so the term used is standard error so one must distinguish between standard deviation which represents your sample population each person and the distribution from the distance from the mean for each person versus standard error where you are looking at how far is the mean from the overall universal mean so your standard errors are also distributed so you would expect your mean to lie 95% of times within 1.96 standard errors of the mean plus minus in all cases because this also follows the gaussian distribution which is the central tendencies theorem so from a sample to estimate the standard error of the mean the formula is s upon root n and this is another basic mathematical concept so how do we establish how close we are to the truth so whenever we try to float a project we look at something called a null hypothesis and what that means is null means no difference so we would say that there is no difference between the study group and the control and we may generate 
an alternative hypothesis, which means that there is a difference between the study group and the control. And if we disprove the null hypothesis, which is our aim, then we would accept the alternative hypothesis and say that our study is showing that the alternative hypothesis is very likely to be correct. Now, what are the errors that we can encounter? So these are terminologies that you have to be familiar with. So you have something called a type one error or an alpha error where you are wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Now I put null in brackets because you can have a hypothesis and a contrary hypothesis. So we'll not get into the nitty gritty of this. But for example, if your null hypothesis is that you're giving a drug and there is no benefit, you might wrongly find a benefit, which might be purely because of chance or any other reason. And you have rejected the null hypothesis. A type 2 error is a beta error where you wrongly accept that the null hypothesis is correct, reject the fact that the drug is working, while in the universal truth it is, act it is actually working. And this usually happens for the simple reason that we have not tested enough people to get what we call statistical significance, which I would like to discuss further on. So if you only tried it in three people or four people, it may not be enough of a sample to tell you that it is really working. You might need to actually test 100 or 200. So this brings us to the next question. How do we design a study so that we have enough people to make a sensible conclusion, not have these type 1 and type 2 errors? So you have to know the concept of a power of the study. So a power of the study is the ability to correctly reject your null hypothesis in favor of an alternative hypothesis. So if you say that the power is 80% or 90%, you would like to say that there is, if you do this study thousands of time, 80% of the time you will be able to correctly reject the null hypothesis. Now it is important to remember here that this depends on having a specified alternative hypothesis. So mathematically, you would have to tell the statistician that I am expecting a 15% improvement or a 6% worsening. Using that mathematics, he will be able to calculate the power of the study for you to give you a sample size. So, uh, I mean, he'll be able to calculate the sample size based on the power that you would want to accept. So the power is one minus the probability of wrongly accepting the null hypothesis as against the alternative hypothesis. Power is one minus what is called the beta error. Traditionally, we accept the beta error 0.2 or 0.1. As the beta error becomes smaller, you will require more and more patience because the smaller your error is, the more of the universal sample you have to include. On the other hand, to avoid a type 1 error, you would like to tell the statistician that you don't want to wrongly reject, uh, wrongly reject the null hypothesis and you want to keep this low and traditionally we keep this alpha error as 0.05%. So when you are doing a statistical analysis, you need to plan your statistics as part of the protocol methodology, the statistics have to be prospectively devised. You need to do a sample size calculation. So you need to tell the statistician alpha traditionally is 0 0.05. Beta, you can choose 0 0.9, 0 0.8. Having a beta as 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 really is quite meaningless because there is a huge chance that your study will actually be wrongly negative. And you need to then estimate clinically the difference that you're looking at and the difference has to be clinically relevant to make sense to someone who's reading the paper so there's no point saying that you want a drug to quadruple survival of human beings you're never going to be able to get that so you need to have a clinically relevant difference given this bit of information 
then the statistician will be able to give you a number that you actually need to look at. You need to then analyze your results looking at the categorical values and numerical values. And I will take you through some of the statistical texts very briefly in the next 15 minutes. Now, when we are comparing this data, the good news is that computers will do the maths. The bad news is that we have to choose the tests and we need to put in data appropriately, which is why it's important to understand what the computer is actually doing. So you know the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. You put in some numbers, another number will come out. You will get a p-value. But what that really means depends on what is the data that you have put in. I would just like to mention a little bit about the p-value here. There is a lot of misunderstanding about what p-value actually means. And maybe we'll have time to discuss this a little bit later on or another talk. But I would just like to put you the American Statistical Association definition of p-value. So p-value represents a probability, right? So you have chosen a spe specific statistical model to do your test. And you have a statistical summary of data, as I've described to you, on which you're doing this statistical model. And for example, it might be a mean difference between two compared groups. So what is the probability that you will get an equal or more extreme outcome than the observed value within this is your p-value. So for example, if you say your p-value is 0.86, that means statistically in 86% of times you report, you repeat the test thousands of times, you are going to get the similar difference or a more extreme difference when you do the test. If you say your p-value is 0 0.04, it means that there is only a 4% chance you repeat the test again and again that you are going to get the same value or a more extreme value. So the lower the p-value, it means the lower the chance that you, that you have actually got this purely by coincidence or by random factors within your data, and you are more likely to accept the null hypothesis. The p-value does not tell you the magnitude of the clinical response. It doesn't tell you whether it's a fantastic drug. It doesn't tell you whether you're going to change the course of mankind. All it tells you is the statistical probability of this having actually come whether it is by chance or whether by the normal variation within the fields, that the probability is very low or very high that this is a repeatable phenomenon. And traditionally, we have used this value of 0 0.05 that we will reject the null hypothesis. So please remember that this 0 0.05 is very arbitrarily defined. So as much as getting 49 on 100 and failing the exam, and getting 51 on 100 and passing the exam does not make the difference between a duffer and a brilliant scholar. Similarly, a p-value between 0 0.049 and 0 0.051 doesn't make the difference between falsehood and reality. It is just a statistical expression of what you are getting as an observed difference between the two data. What is the likelihood that this has come because of chance? So this is some concept that you must try and understand. Now, when we are comparing two groups, how are these statistical tests chosen? So it is important to see whether these groups are unpaired. That is two or more independent samples drawn from the same population or whether they are paired. Now, if you have done two tests on the same person, then obviously the natural human variations within that sample would be nullified. So your statistics are much tighter and it is you will require a smaller difference to find significance. Right? Now, so there is, is there an association between the two variables is something you may ask. Is there an agreement between assessments? Are we looking at time to an event such as death or disease recurrence and are we looking at trends? So depending on all these questions, there are statistical tests that we can use. Now, a student's t-test is a very common test. 
So this is used for small data, similar to what you're going to gather in your thesis. It is used for numerical data. It is used for parametric data, which is following the Gaussian curve. And there are tests which will tell you whether the data is parametric. You require the mean and the standard deviation of the two groups. And it's a simple concept that if you have both drawn from a same population, there will be a considerable overlap. If you demonstrate that there is no overlap between the two groups or a negligible overlap, which is outside what we have a pre-decided zone of significance, then you would say that the groups are likely to come from two different samples and not from the same sample. There are terms which you'll have to put in when you're looking at the t-test, one-sided versus two-sided and paired. A paired t-test is on the same sample as I've explained earlier. If you have the same person, you're re repeating measurements, for example, you're taking blood pressure before and after a drug on the same person, you put in the paired t-test because it is the same person on whom you're doing the test and putting in two readings. And this will give you a tighter statistic. The one sided would imply that your, your hypothesis implies that the movement can only be in one direction. So you don't expect the blood pressure medicine to significantly raise the blood pressure. It can only lower it. So then you can imply prospectively before you start the study that you'd like to use a one-sided test to look at this data and the statistician will guide you on whether this is suitable use. What happens if you have multiple readings? Then you use something called the ANOVA test. Now, the reason that you don't use repeated t-tests is because you must understand that there's always a chance of error every time you do the test. And the more times you do tests on a similar group, your errors are going to keep multiplying. So if you say that the chance of error is 5%, you keep multiplying the test, then this errors will add 5%, 5%, 5%. So if you actually do many, many tests on the same population, you are bound to get some outcome by chance. So if you are doing repeated tests on the similar readings, then you need to correct for repeated analysis and you would need something such as a correction. And I've just put one example here. The statistician will guide you or alternatively you use the ANOVA test, which will tell you that you have three readings, four readings or five readings. One of these readings is unlikely to come from the same population or more than one reading may not come from the same population. So that would be the ANOVA test if you have multiple readings. If you have something called non-parametric data where it is not universally distributed, then you want to take out the effect of large numbers or very small numbers such as this on a mean or standard deviation, which depends on the absolute value. So these tests, the Man Whitney test, Wilcoxon sign rank test, or for multiple groups, the Kruskal Wallace test. Just remember these names because you know this is what you will be discussing with the statistician. Depends on putting group A, group B, or C for the Kruskal Wallace test within order, just giving ranks to each. Now, if this group actually had a higher number than this group then you would find that if you summed the ranks in this group, then the score would be much higher than this group. And the sum of the ranks when compared would give you a difference. If the groups actually were relatively similar and there were just a couple of outliers here, if you sum the ranks, you would find the sum of the ranks would be equivalent. And you would say that both data came from uh, just as a random variation from the same population. So this depends on the rank in ascending order and not on the absolute number which you get. So it takes away from the numerical value of the data and just looks at its magnitude. Ratios, as I explained earlier, are an important way to express data. You must understand the difference between odds ratio and a relative risk. So for example, you're looking at a 25% outcome versus a 55% uh, 50 outcome, a relative risk is just the numbers divided by each other. 50 upon 25, the relative risk of this event is 2 as compared to this event. The odds ratios, the 25% so 
there is 75 to 25 so the odds are 3 is to 1 to get a 25% outcome the odds to get a 50% outcome is 50 50 which is 1 is to 1 so for the same data your odds ratio is 3 if you intuitively ask somebody 25% outcome 50% outcome how much better is is the 50% outcome than the 25% outcome the intuitive answer is 2 so relative risk gives the intuitive and probably the apps the best way of representing the data truthfully the odds will usually be higher than the relative risk so people love to put it in papers because they find that this is better the odds ratio should only be used in retrospective case control studies because here you are artificially creating your denominator and the odds takes out the denominator unless unlike the relative risk which works on a percentage so that's the only place where your odds ratio should be used the 95 percent confidence interval is a very good way to represent what the truthful outcome would actually be so if the study is repeated an infinite number of times the data will lie between this range in 95 percent of cases now this actually depends on the numbers the more the patients the more you're closer to the universal population the narrower is the confidence interval so the same way i showed you 50 versus 25 percent relative risk is two your 95 percent confidence interval will show you a relative risk as low as 0.28 and as high as 14.2 when you increase to 400 it comes down to 1.6 to 2.4 as you increase population to 4000 it narrows to 1.8 to 2.2 but notice that the degree of narrowing between 400 and 4000 is not as dramatic as between 4 to 400 so here you added 360 patients here you added 3600 but not got it too much narrow so this is where you use your judgment in designing a study is to how narrow a confidence interval that you're really going to get and this will tell you that the truth is likely to 95% of cases lie between this range and you can then interpret the data. So a risk reduction is similarly a formula, reduce the risk depending on the percentage. An absolute risk reduction is just subtraction of the two. And the number needed to treat is the inverse of the absolute risk reduction. So one upon 0.25 here, which is the risk reduction is for so the interpretation of this data is that you need to treat four to help one because you're getting an absolute risk reduction of 25 percent when you're comparing groups for example in a two by two table you have something called a degree of freedom right which is just one minus each of these multiplied by each each of this a fisher's exact test is a statistical test which will tell you a precise probability of this or a worse event actually happening obviously when you have numbers like this it will require a lot of computation to do this so you have something called a chi-square test where you sum the observed minus the expected and divide by the expected so i've just given an example here this is how your test statistic will look so here you have this same table which i showed you earlier 13 7 7 13 you would expect that because there are 20 in each group that the event should actually be 10 and 10 if they are evenly distributed here you have a difference from each so you have 7 minus 10 minus 3 you square it to take away the negative sign so you get 9 you have 13 minus 10 again 3 square it to have 9 so you add up all this you, you get something called a chi square statistic you look against a standard chart which is given and it tells you that for this statistic chi square statistic of 3.6 this is the probability of this or a worse outcome having come and that probability is 0 0.057 you have pre-decided a value of 0 0.05 so therefore you would say that this is really not significant at this value there are other tests such as a measure of association i'll quickly run through this so you have something called this correlation and regression the difference between these two is regression can predict one parameter by knowing another 
So for example, you're familiar with the straight line rule, y is equal to mx plus c, the exponential rule, y is equal to e to the power x. So here you can predict one parameter by knowing the other. So you can predict height from knowing weight in the population. A correlation just plots the data and tells you that does it fit a positive or a negative to a good fit or a poor fit. So you calculate something called an R squared statistic. If the R squared is closer to one, then you have a good or a strong correlation. If it is closer to zero, then you have a weak correlation. And if it is zero, then you really have no correlation and a random scatter. Agreement between assessments is something called a Kappa statistic, or if you have more groups and interclass correlation coefficient. And I would like to end by this very important concept of a time to event statistic. So you have something called a survival curve or a time to event curve. And I've given you an example here. So this is a survival curve of males who are handicapped over the age of 10 in the US. You'll find that you know the survival decreases to the age of 30, 40, 50, 60. This is the standard US population. So you find that there is a very slow decline to the age of 60. And then as age increases, there's a rapid decline. And you can then compare what is the difference in survivals between this, this group of pe people who are handicapped at the age of 10 and the normal US population. So this would be a simple survival curve, percentage surviving over the age. The kaplan meyer analysis is a very powerful way of doing it. It has multiple advantages. So if you have a variable time to inclusion, for example, you started the study today, you're recruiting for four years, you're stopping at five years. Some will have a follow-up only of one year. Some will have a follow-up of three years and four years. This will actually allow you to include patients with variable times of inclusion. It allows you to censor patients who have loss of follow-up or to drop out. So this is a topic which probably can be taken in detail at some point. So at every stage of your event, which might be mortality, varicial bleeding, disease recurrence, whatever the point might be, you have an absolute drop in this. This drop is calculated by the probability of not having the event to this time to having the event at this time. Each point at which you have a loss to follow up or the patient has completed the study at that point and has the survival at that point, you'd mark it by a bar. And therefore, you have these steps of progression. If you note the steps get bigger towards the end, because less and less patients at risk, the longer your follow-up is. And you can therefore have a visual picture of the survival at this point. You can calculate the survival at five years, 10 years using this. You can also compare two groups. This is showing you the difference between the well and moderately differentiated and the poorly differentiated at this point. And as each patient is lost to follow up, you can see the sensors and you can get a good visual expression of this group of data. To compare these time to event, you have the log rack test and the Cox proportional hazards test. So log rank test has a null hypothesis that there's no difference in survival curves. It is based on the observed versus the expected events, similar to a chi-squared test at each point. Your proportional hazards depends on multiple time variant covariates such as age, stage, smoking, but it assumes that the risk is constant over time. And a new problem has come in, as you know, a lot of uh, immunotherapy has been achieved. So you often get curves like this. So this is a curve from a paper on jeftinib versus carboplat, uh, platinum and placitex cell for lung cancer. You find that these curves are crossing. So though you'll find that jeftinib gives you a better survival over time, initial survival is poor. So clearly your hazard is not proportional over time. It changes with time. So therefore, it would be incorrect to use this as a statistical test of comparison. You need to consult your statistician. The survival curves are crossing. You need a non-proportional hazards to look at this. So these are subtleties when you are interpreting the paper where you have to understand these tests to know what you're doing. So just to summarize, I'm sorry because of the limit of time, a lot of concepts might be have been brushed over very quickly. We need to have a well-planned study you need a prospective data collection plan. It's not that you look at the data and say, how do I crunch it to get a p-value? Your p.05 is not sacrosanct. You need completely honest and complete data collection to give you a true picture at the end to be as close to the truth. You need appropriate data presentation as a summary statistic. 
you need appropriate tests to negate your null hypothesis based on the type of data you've collected and come to a rational conclusion. So I would just like to thank all the statistics lectures that I have actually heard before and many more such people. And I would like to end here and I don't know if there's time for question answers. I would hand it back to Professor Kapoor. Thank you for a patient listening. Unfortunately, I can't see the audience. So, you know, sometimes confused faces tell me that I've completely gone over that and that tends to improve my quality of talks. But Zoom has its limitations. So please do forgive me for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudeep. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed because your examples which you gave uh, clarified so many of uh, uh, the concepts. Uh, we had a very good attendance today. Normally, we don't have such good attendance, which means that it is an important topic and students are interested to know and learn about statistics. We have a question in the chat from Neha. Uh, maybe you can take that. Yeah, with respect to standard error. Right. So, no, so that's a very important question. So, uh, Again, as, as I've explained, we are estimating the population mean based on the sample that we have, right? So we are going backwards. See, we don't know the universal population, but we know that 95% of time, the population mean will have this distribution and what we have measured should be within this range. So if we calculate from our population mean, two standard errors on each side, we can conversely correlate that the population mean lies within this range. So we are actually going backwards from the data we have to predict the range in which the population mean lies. Uh, is that clear or am I unclear with what I've said? Yeah, you want to come in? Unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So was that clear or uh, am I uh, unclear? So we are uh, estimating the population mean with 95% certainty based on the mean that we have studied. Sir, uh, so, it that this is that have, uh, sir uh, so it means that as we have done so many studies previously, so we have some no, idea no, no, no. of all the different populations. So no, we have done a study, right, of 100 or 200 patients or whatever it is. We have calculated our mean, right? We are calculating the standard error of mean and saying that we are hypothesizing that using this central tendencies theorem, we understand that because we have taken a random representative sample from the population, the population mean will lie within this range. So it is oh. an assumption. Yes, sir. Got it. Am I right, Sudeep? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, who knows the reality or the truth? So, it's a very relevant question. So, uh, again, if I go back to the table, if this is the distribution of reality, right? We have calculated a mean. The mean may lie here, it may lie here, it may lie here, it may lie here. But when we calculate a standard error, supposing it be lie at this point where my arrow is, I don't know whether you can see the arrow right then if you two standard errors will come here to here so we will anticipate that the population mean will lie in this range if we get the population mean here we will say that we are 95 percent confident that the population mean will lie between this and this range because using our data we are going to project what is the population mean based on the data that we have collected it does does, does that make sense now Yes, would, it yes. be, would it be right to say that if our sample is uh, not representative of the population, then our calculation or as will be incorrect. Also... Yeah, so we, this, this whole works on the presumption that because we have randomly taken the sample, we are representative of the population. So if, if you actually take the education of people in your institute, that is not representative of the population mean. So it has to be a truly random sample of the population. Then when you measure it, then you will get a true representation. So the randomness is very important. So the word random figures when you are using the central tendencies theorem. 
Dr. Anand, my colleague, wants sir, to ask you. In your presentation, yeah, sir, uh, when, we, when you told us regarding this uh, sample size calculation, the formula right. for sample size calculation, you have taken the beta as a uh, 0.8 or 0.9. Yes. But sir, in, in general, beta, yes. Yes, yes. Sir. We in generally, sir, when we calculate the sample size, we usually take the alpha, uh, power of study is approximately 80%. Then the beta will be calculated 0 0.8, 0 0.2. Sorry, so, so my, my, my mistake, it should be 1 minus beta. Yes, it's sir. an error in my slide, which I'm glad you pointed out to me. I'll correct it immediately. Yes. So yes, beta sir. should be 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. 0 0.2. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that is a very good point and I will immediately correct it. So that is a very good observation. And thank you for listening to my talk so carefully. <laughs> thank you. So 1 minus beta is 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. So the par is actually 1 minus beta. Yes. Yeah, which the par should be 80 or 90%. 90%. Thank you very much. I see Dr. Richa, my colleague from SGPGI uh, in the audience. Richa, you want to say anything, ask anything? I only want to thank Dr. Sudeep. He has handled a very difficult topic in a very short period of time. And he has touched on all the important concepts. I think it's like a framework for all of us to, you know, build up our um, uh, understanding. And uh, the only way to understand statistics is to, uh, every time you read a paper, look at the statistics carefully and try to understand the concept. So thank you, Dr. Sudeep, very much. Any other students wants to ask anything? Please come in. Avinash, if you are there, you want to say something? Avinash uh, has been helping us uh, uh, in uh, making these sessions uh, possible. And uh, all these sessions are recorded, Dr. Sudeep. And your lecture also uh, would be recorded and posted on the YouTube channel of uh, Jaipur Surgical Tutorial. So if there are no more questions, then uh, once again, I would like to thank Dr. Sudeep Shah. Uh, at least I understood a lot of things which I never could understand uh, so far because your examples, I think, were very, very illustrative, very illustrative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the kind introduction. And um, I, I think as very rightly pointed out, it is work in progress. So all journal clubs should also focus on statistics. So I think uh, work in progress and uh, if there are any you know, there are so many people more qualified than me to discuss different aspects, and I'm sure you'll have many, many years of future. No, but at the part of my mind, I should give this talk because they go too much into theoretical and mathematical details, which then becomes difficult for clinicians to understand. Yes, that so is why I wanted yes, so surgeons are the victim. So when the victim talks, yes. it always comes from the viewpoint of a distressed soul rather than from a theoretical expert, which is why I think um, I'm happy to give this talk, though I'm not an expert. In fact, I may request you once again to give the same or similar talk to our entire faculty in our uh, clinical combined round, because this is something which is going to be useful to the uh, anyone who wants to do research or who wants to read a good paper. So I may trouble you once again. It is my, my pleasure, sir. Thank you very much for your kind comments. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We will close the session then. Bye. Thank you so much.